Okay, so welcome to HDC. Uh, my name is Robert Shalaker. I'm uh, the lecturer in systematic theology here, amongst other jobs that get thrown my way. Um, and this series of lectures, we're planning to look at the Institutes, uh, of the book written by Calvin over many years. But before we start diving into that, I was just going to have a look at a little short introduction uh, about what we're going to do. Um, for many, like me, who became a Christian later in life, when we talk about Calvin, um, different pictures come into your mind. Um, this is what comes into my mind when I was in my teens and my twenties. Uh, this famous character, of Calvin, on the right, and his friend Hobbes on the left. It's a cartoon strip. I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but uh, it's very popular in my youth. Um, and that's what many people out there, if you say Calvin, will think of something like this or some other organisation with that name now. But even within the church, when you say Calvin, these sort of pictures immediately spring to mind. These darkened pictures of a, a gloomy looking character, thinking hard with a big book and all the rest of it. So is that our image of Calvin? Is Calvin really for a special sort of fun-loving person? The people that like to read heavy books and <laughs> complex theology. Well, my argument is not, and that's the, the purpose of this series of lectures. It's not a, going to be a, a lecture series about Calvin, his history or anything like that. What I want to do is just to dive straight into the Institutes and read them for ourselves and, and explore the theology that uh, Calvin actually writes. C.S. Lewis wrote an introduction to uh, a book written by Athanasius in the early church. The book's called On the Incarnation. But C.S. Lewis's introduction is really well worth a read. It's only a few pages long. But in it, at one point, he, uh, well, he's basically arguing why people should read old books. And at one point he writes, and in this quote, um, you need to replace Platonism with Calvinism for our purposes. But he wrote, thus... I have found as a tutor in the English literature that if the average student wants to find out something about Platonism, the very last thing he thinks of doing is to take a translation of Plato off the library shelf and read the symposium. He would rather read some dreary modern book ten times along, all about isms and influences, and only once in twelve pages telling him what Plato actually said. The error is rather an amiable one, for it springs from humility. The student is half afraid to meet one of the great philosophers face to face. He feels himself inadequate and thinks he will not understand him. But if he only knew, the great man, just because of his greatness, is much more intelligible than his modern commentator. And so that's really the aim of what we're looking at in the next few weeks, is to actually read uh, Calvin and explore uh, his institutes. Now, the genesis of this series of lectures comes from uh, uh, my experience as an external examiner in Oak Hill Bible College down south. And one of the modules they run there for their distance learning students is reading through the institutes. And as I was thinking of something to give up these lectures, I thought, well, that's a really good idea. Uh, let's do that. And one of the textbooks that they have for that is this book by uh, Tony Lane. Uh, it's Reading the Reader's Guide to Calvin Institutes. Now, you can have a look at this at the end. I'll leave it around here. You can have a flick through it. It's a very, very useful book. It just gives notes as you're reading through highlights and selected readings. You'll notice on the first page of the handout I've given you, um, that's basically his selected text through at the Institutes. So if you want to expand on what you're uh, listening to here and you want to explore the Institutes further, that's a very good place to start, uh, the highlights uh, of the Institutes. Um, my approach in <coughs> this series is, as I've already said really, is to just approach the Institutes directly. There are myriads upon myriads of books about Calvin and about Calvinism and the influences and all, all that sort of thing. But what I want to do is for us just to open the book and read it somewhat naively, if you like, and just see what he says. 
And I think I'm legitimate in doing that because that was the Institute's very purpose. Calvin wrote it for the intelligent Christian to have an overview of what the faith is all about. And so that's why, how I want us to approach it at this time, just to read the Institute and explore his view of what Christianity is all about. And of course, we are just looking at the Institutes, and Calvin is much more than the Institutes. There's all his commentaries. They're readily available, and I find them very useful, even now, written 400 years ago, but they're so pertinent and so accurate uh, that they're bang up to date almost, even though they've been that long ago. But we won't be exploring those. And of course, there are his letters and his sermons, some of which have been translated and published in various volumes. So there's all these other aspects to Calvin that we don't necessarily see in institutes. So it's just to bear that in mind, as we're exploring this, we can only explore a certain area. But I think it's a useful area to start understanding uh, <coughs> who Calvin is and what he thought. So, the Institutes. There are more than one version of the Institutes. We have uh, this version here, you'll recognise it, taken from this very copy photograph there. But we'll see there, on the, on the left, we've got the 1559 edition of the Institute, obviously translated into English. And on the right, we have the uh, 1536, the first edition of the Institutes. And so as we explore them and we sort of rotate the picture, we can see it was definitely a work in progress. Um, he started with quite a, a slim book, um, and then he develops it over the years, rearranges the material, adds to it, and it builds up into this rather large work. In some ways, it could be an off-putting work just because of its size. And that's why I suspect that Tony Lane wrote that guide, was to draw people in and say, well, it's a big book, but here are some good extracts. And then our lectures and the series, we're going to ex even fewer extracts and just dip in and out of the institutes to get a flavour of what Calvin's theology is all about. At the beginning of this edition, we've got the desk, you'll notice that it has its symbols. Um, the edition we have here, translated, is based on the 1559 edition, the last one, but the editor and translators have also incorporated earlier material and uh, explanations of where the material comes from. So you see all these little letters appearing. So I'll just put this in if you're going to follow along and actually read some of the institutes and using this version. Look out for these little uh, figures and that explains what they're all about. Um, it's not some kind of weird mathematical formula, but uh, uh, guidance from where the, the text has come from. So, it's a large work, and we see it in, in different formats in Britain. Um, we have this one, which is the Battles edition, it's here to refer to, but you'll have come across, and I didn't bring it, unfortunately, I meant to, the Beverage edition. Um, the advantage of the Beverage edition is it's free online, so if you don't fancy going out and you know, borrowing from a library or paying huge sums of money for, for this edition, there is an edition that you'll find readily available as a PDF online. Uh, it, was, it was a standard uh, edition, really, for many decades, published in uh, the 19th century, so it's a bit Victorian in its uh, language. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a sound translation and a useful resource. Um, I will base my notes on this because I have, I have a copy of this, and so my quotations throughout this series of lectures will be from the Battles edition not the beverage one, but you can see the, well, if you're reading the other one, you'll be able to see how closely they are aligned. There are other editions around, if you rush into shops, uh, in 2014, the Banner of Truth uh, have published another edition, um, but that was based on the, the 1541 French edition of the Institutes. Um, they chose that because it's, it's not as intimidating, it's not as thick, um, uh, and they think it's more suitable for immediate use for the, the modern-day Christian. It's a mere 920 pages instead of the uh, 1,728 pages of, of this edition. 
So you can see it's really quite slimmed down to just on nearly a thousand pages. And they argue that it avoids some of the technical details and much of the polemics that you find in the final work. Um, Tony Lane's selection avoids a lot of the polemics as well um, and concentrates on the, the main core bits of the theology. And again, that's what we intend to do during this lecture, um, lecture series. Now, of course, we're dipping in and out. And so we, we're not going to get complete understanding of Calvin's theology. And the passages that I have, or chapters I've chosen to dip in and out, are normally because they're perhaps distinctive in Calvin. Maybe just subtly, but they are different. And of course, there are large chunks that I won't bother looking at, looking at which are important bits of theology which are held more widely. But we just don't have the time in eight weeks to cover uh, 1,700 pages of text. So this really is the idea, is to give you a flavour, fire you up for Calvin, and then you'll spend the rest of your life reading Calvin as institutes <laughs> and uh, all his commentaries. So that's the aim of the game. Okay, so that's the reason for the programme you've got here. I think if you flip over onto the next side of the handout, you'll see what we're going to cover over uh, the next um, few weeks. So if you want to read ahead and reflect, that's fine. Um, or you may just want to come and listen uh, and, and go away and read afterwards if you so desire. With most of the other lectures, what I'm planning to do is follow pretty closely a section of Calvin's writings in order and just extract his thought and, and comment on it as we go. Um, today is slightly different because I want to uh, just dive into the introduction he has in one of his uh, editions. And I asked the question that I had on the first slide there, what's the use of systematic theology? Because I think there's a little hint in his introduction about why he wrote the Institutes that is helpful for us uh, to apply to our thinking of what, how we use systematic theology today. Joel Green, in an article, Scripture and Theology, Uniting Two So Long Divided, quotes that there, there exists an iron curtain between biblical studies and systematic theology. Now, his concern was for the disciplines in academia, where you have a, some of my college, colleagues studying biblical theology, and I'm studying systematic theology, and the two seem to live almost in watertight compartments. But... The question could also be true in many of our churches. What's systematic theology got to do with the Bible? Or is the Bible helped by systematic theology? Or, or what? what's the relationship between the two? And that's what I want to explore today. Before we go any further, we perhaps need to define what is systematic theology. It's perhaps not a term um, that many people absolutely know. Um, quite often when I people say, what do you do? Well, I lecture in systematic theology. They always say, what's systematic theology? Well, here's a couple of definitions. Um, one's from John Frame, who says, um, systematic theology um, as the application of God's word by persons to all areas of life. Okay. Um, Robert Raymond, in his introduction to systematic theology, says, by systematic theology, I refer to the discipline that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us about a given topic? Now, these are good working definitions, but I think at the end of today, I want to show you it's a bit more subtle than that. There's a bit more going on than what these definitions perhaps um, give us. And these definitions, as you look at them, they come from scholars that would call themselves uh, Reformed theologians, following the general footsteps of Calvin and the other Reformers on the face of it, agree with the Reformation principle sola scriptura, by scripture alone. And what the reformers meant by that is that the Bible is the, the primary authority for all theological <coughs> and ecclesiological matters. This has sometimes evolved into a Bible-only approach, which claims that only the Bible is to be used in theology. Now, the reformers didn't mean that, um, and it's not really possible when you think about it just to use the Bible. Um, you need to think and apply it yourselves anyhow, which is what systematic theology tries to do. We didn't even go down that direction just now. 
But another thing that's derived from this idea, if uh, systematic theology uh, comes from the Bible in this way, if all our theology is derived and has its authority from the Bible, then it follows that systematic theology is the result of reading the Bible, the end product of a chain, if you like. You read the Bible, you understand the Bible, and you write theology. You read the Bible, you exegete it, organize the data, reflect on the world around us, and there we have it, a systematic theology. Clearly, if that is the model, um, biblical studies and the Bible has to be primary. The reading of the Bible and exegesis um, is the essential, and then if you want to systematize it, that's optional extra. If you want to do that, you can ask the questions and uh, make a system out of what the Bible teaches. Now, if you just take that as your model, it can have a couple of unintended consequences. One is the one I just mentioned, uh, that systematic theology is an uh, optional extra, somewhat distant from the Bible. The Bible has God's truth, and then well, it's up to you whether you bother systematizing it or not. And then there's also the idea that, that, that systematic theology, therefore, is some kind of shackle to biblical reading. Um, that somehow that we come to the Bible fresh, we exegete it, and then build our theology. Um, not any other way. Uh, makes systematic theology think, well, it's an end product only, and not uh, a means to an end, which I'll see is uh, what Calvin's suggesting. So in one blog title that I looked, uh, the blog was asking, is there a wedge being driven between biblical theology and systematic theology? And the guy writes, our understanding of God naturally arises from his word. And so there is a natural progression from exegesis to biblical theology to systematics and to spiritual theology. The spectrum differs a bit depending on who is speaking, but the sum of the relationship is that good biblical theology rests on good exegesis and good systematics depends upon good biblical theology. And obviously, good application of scripture in the life of the believer also depends on good systematics. You might even look at the relationship between each of these areas as a pyramid building on each other. Something like that. Is the Reformation ideal, then, that systematic theology is the end goal of good exegesis? The end, or a byproduct even, of biblical studies. Now, a few years ago, in 2008 to be specific, it was the 500th anniversary of Calvin's birth. And many people were reflecting on the institutes amongst other uh, of Calvin's works. And I had the opportunity to look at a part of it in the Reformed Theology module we were running at the time. And I was surprised to find Calvin's idea of the place and role of systematic theology, the role of his institutes, was quite different from this model. Calvin, compared to a modern theologian, was a bit of a polymath. His writing before the modern era, where everyone specialised in different strands, um, and as I've said at the beginning, he wrote the Institutes, his systematic theology work, if you like, and he wrote commentaries. He was preaching many times a week, and he wrote pastoral letters and other, other letters too. And so he approached theology from all these different perspectives at once. Um, and Gerald Bray, in his analysis of Calvin's interpretation of Scripture, um, makes six points. And one of them is, is this one, the sixth one, that I want to draw your attention to. It's the, the holistic approach that Calvin had. Biblical interpretation in Calvin passes through three distinct but related phases. If any one of these phases is omitted, the text will not be interpreted properly. The three, the three phases are exegesis, represented by his commentaries, Dogmatics, 
not a word for systematic theology in this context, represented by his institutes, and preaching represented by his sermons. Gerald Bray goes on to argue that exegesis I'm going to quote this one. Exegesis, is, this is a quote, quote, exegesis is logically the first of these because unless we understand what a text means, it is impossible to apply it, he argues. And at first glance, that would seem to be Calvin's logic and the application of the Reformation principle sola scriptura in theology. But I want to argue in a moment, Calvin's view is a bit more complex than that, and in many ways preempts some of the discussions that you see in modern day hermeneutics, hermeneutics and interpretation of the Bible. Now these three elements listed are essential to hermeneutics, that is the correct interpretation of the Bible. But Bray explains the consequences of missing one of these I have a slide there. I skipped a slide in my periphery vision. Um, uh, yeah, so if you miss one of these, it has consequences. So exegesis and dogmatics, systematic theology, without preaching, are dry and academic. There's no application. Exegesis and preaching with no dogmatics are subjective and contentless. A passage of scripture will be interpreted without regard to its proper context in the word of God as a whole. Finally, dogmatics and preaching without exegesis are mere propaganda. They're not based on a proper assimilation of the facts. It's all three are essential. Now, I think in the contemporary church, um, there's a temptation to have a hearty amen for the first and last of these scenarios, but forget the second scenario. We're quite, you would say, well, exegesis and dogmatics left it out without any preaching is pointless because it's not been applied. You know, you try to read the Bible, understand it, and not apply it is uh, dry and academic. No point to it. And we'd agree that uh, if you just start writing a, a systematic theology and start preaching without any reference to uh, the scriptures, then you're just getting human opinion, propaganda, whatever the political or whatever motivations behind the speaker or writer. And so you'd agree with that. But sometimes, at least I, in my hearing, I've heard that this second one is a bit more questionable. Exegesis and preaching with no dogmatics are subjective. What is the role of systematic theology when you exegete a passage when you look at the Bible, and when they preach from it. Is that pyramid model that we looked at in that other slide, the way it is working, or is there something else going on? Um, now, it goes without saying that Calvin saw the scriptures as the source and power for the theology. Famous section of the Institutes, and we'll look at it again when we look at his Doctrine of Scripture in a, in a couple of weeks. He writes, Just as bleary eyed men and those with weak vision, if he thrusts before them a most beautiful volume, even if they recognize it to be some sort of writing, yet can scarcely construe two words. But with the aid of spectacles, <coughs> will begin to read distinctly. So, Scripture gathering up otherwise confused knowledge of God in our minds, having dispensed our dullness, clearly shows us the true God. Scripture are the spectacles by which we see God rightly. Scripture are the spectacles by which we see his hand in creation and in our own lives correctly. For Calvin, Scripture is the way to interpret the world and everything in it. So clearly, uh, the role of scripture is absolutely central and prominent to Calvin's worldview. However, in the introduction to um, uh, Institutes, uh, titled John Calvin to the Reader, he explains the reason and the purpose of his systematic work at the Institutes. It's a rather long quotation, but we'll have a look at it in a bit more depth. Moreover, it has been my purpose 
in this labour to prepare and instruct candidates in the sacred theology for the reading of the divine word, in order that they may be able both to have easy access to it and to advance in it without stumbling. For I believe I have so embraced the sum of religion in all its parts and have arranged it in such an order that any, if anyone rightly grasps it, it will not be difficult for him to determine what he ought to especially to seek in Scripture, and to what end he ought to relate its contents. If, after this road has been paved, I shall publish any interpretations of Scripture, I shall always condense them, because I shall have no need to undertake long doctrinal discussions and to digress into commonplaces. In this way, the godly reader will be spared a great annoyance and boredom, provided he approach the scripture armed with a knowledge of this, the present work as a necessary tool. Okay, so there's three points I'd like to, to draw out of this. Um, the first one is a chronological point. Calvin did systematic theology before daring to write his commentaries. This to the reader section, which we've quoted here, is from the final 1559 edition of the Institutes. But this reference uh, to the forthcoming publishing of commentaries appears in the 1539 edition, Yay. according to the battles uh, footnotes. Calvin's first commentary, which is on Romans, was published the following year, 1540, and then 1 and 2 Corinthians in 1546, and then a steady stream afterwards. So, while I'm saying, obviously, that Calvin did not write his systematic theology before reading scripture, he didn't just dream it out of nothing, what he did do is that um, he felt it necessary to formulate and get his systematic theology straight and published before he went on to write his commentaries. Indeed, J.I. Packer uh, notes in a work, on Calvin's View of Scripture, after presumably a very busy night in the study, that the 1559 edition has 7,000 Bible references in. Um, so clearly, his institutes uh, are built on Scripture, a, a deep knowledge of Scripture. But he wrote it first, before he went on to write his commentaries. There are some practical reasons for doing that. One is, as he says, commentaries, or rather Bray says, that he has a view that commentaries should possess clarity and brevity. By writing the Institutes, Calvin was able to condense his commentaries into more manageable documents. And this was out of respect for the Bible itself, according to Bray, because the text not only stood above the interpreter, says Bray, but the interpreter must demonstrate this by serving the text to his reason, readers, not by conceiving it in obscurity or long-windedness. Calvin had views on his contemporaries. He felt Philip Melanchthon's focus on the difficult parts of the text was problematic because if you spend all your time working from one difficult issue of the text to the next, all you do is moving from one problem to another, missing out the perfectly clear teaching in between. And Martin Busser was just too long-winded, because if you're trying to deal with all the issues that come from, that you deal with in systematic theology in a commentary, you just become a very convoluted work. So Calvin's idea was, was a practical one. Give a systematic theology that explains the big picture, and then people can engage with the commentaries and with the text, equipped with a tool, as he saw his institutes. And that's the third point. In his introduction on that quote, we see the godly reader approach scripture armed with a necessary tool. If you were sharp-eyed at the beginning of this, you'll notice the title was not what's the point of systematic theology, but what is the use of systematic theology? And this is what I think I'm drawing out of, uh, out of the introduction here, is that for Calvin, systematic theology had a use, a tool, 
to enable people to read scripture rightly. Now, if we're thinking of that pyramid model in an absolute sense, that's going to have this idea of what's going on is going to have some kind of implication here. It isn't that we start off, read the Bible, exegete it, you've got your Bible knowledge, and then you do systematic theology. If you, in some sense, you need systematic theology in order to read the Bible correctly in the first place, is what um, the Institute is all about, and what Calvin was trying to do. It's an issue not missed in some modern theology too. Green and Turner write, what effects should biblical texts produce on theology? What does it mean for theologians to read, understand, interpret, and apply the scriptures? We believe that this is a good question. But it does not grapple with a related question of at least equal, if not more, importance. What effects should theology produce on biblical interpretation? How should our theology affect our reading of the Bible? Now, if we're getting rid of the pyramid model and we're saying, well, we need systematic theology in order to read the Bible, and then we read the Bible in order to produce systematic theology, haven't we got a bit of a, a circular argument going on here? This is a bit more than just a two-way street between systematic theologians and biblical theologians, or the Bible and uh, uh, dogmatics. We seem to have some kind of circular argument going here, and, and nobody particularly likes it, the circular argument. And the other issue that might um, strike you is whether, from a single quotation from the Institutes in the introduction, that I am justified in producing this as a, as a theory of Calvin's. To get, dispel the last point first, I'll just look at a few more quotations, this time from the subject matter of the present work. This originally written in the 1560 French edition. Calvin writes, Although Holy Scripture contains a perfect doctrine, to which one can add nothing, since it is since it our Lord has meant to display the infinite reassurance of his wisdom, Yet a person who has not much practice in it has good reason for some guidance and direction to know what he ought to look for in it in order not to wander hither and thither but to hold to a sure path that he may always be pressing towards the end to which the Holy Spirit calls him. So suggesting you know, the read the Bible needs some kind of guidance not to get lost in byways in reading the scripture. He continues a bit later. I dare not render too favourably, sorry, I dare not render too favourable testimony concerning it, the Institute, and it wants to boast, nor yet declare how profitable the reading of it could be, for I would shrink from seeming to appraise my work too highly. Nevertheless, I can at least promise that it can be a key to open a way for all children of God into a good and right understanding of Holy Scripture. Thus, if henceforth our Lord gives me the means and opportunity of writing some commentaries, I shall use the greatest possible brevity, because there will be no need for long digressions, seeing that I have here treated at length almost all the articles pertaining to Christianity. So you can see there, this is a guide for the children of God to read the Scriptures right, but also the practical issue of making sure his commentary is stuck to the key points and not have to explain the basics and the framework all the time of the text. And then finally, he car carries on, Thus I exhort all those who have reverence for the Lord's word to read it and to impress it diligently upon their memory if they wish to have, first, a sum of Christian doctrine and second, a way to benefit greatly from reading the Old as well as the New Testament. Above all, I must urge him to have recourse to scripture in order to weigh the testimonies that I adduce from it. Okay, so we can see what Calvin is proposing in the way of uh, engaging with scripture here. If you have reverence to God's word, read his word, he's saying, and, and think about it, impress it on your memory and so forth. 
for it gives you the sum of Christian doctrine. And therefore, secondly, you'll benefit in your reading of the New Testament. But he also says, have recourse to the scripture in order to weigh the testimonies that he induces from it. So you, you see that circular approach here. He's written it so you can read right in scriptures, but when reading the scriptures right, you've got to weigh up what he's actually written. Has he written it correctly? Um, uh, and there's this process going on, which is not a pyramid at all, but more a kind of um, circular action. So you can see clearly that scripture and exegesis is thoroughly important to Calvin. It's on the basis on which he builds his theology. But he builds his theology with a purpose of being able to read scripture. So we have this model that systematic theology it provides a big framework, the understanding of how to uh, fit the pieces of the Bible together as we read them in depth. That's Jesus. Okay, so we're fairly clear that that is Calvin's approach from those quotes. The problem is, isn't this just circular reasoning? And circular reasoning doesn't prove anything, we think. But there is a strand in, in, in reform theology, even in that modern period, argues that, um, in fact, when we look at it, most of our reasoning at the base of it is circular. For example, a rationalist might argue every valid truth claim has to be reasonable, that is, based on valid reasoned argument. And that's what rationalists hold, you know, if you can't believe something unless you can show it's reasonable and you can reason to it. But that very statement, that claim, well, how do you show that to be true? Well, they would argue by reasoning. So they would say, well, the only way you can show that, that every valid truth claim has to be reasonable is by showing that is reasonable itself. Which, when you think of it, is just a circular argument. But you're always going to get that when you get down to ultimate truths, if you like. I mean, we're happy to say God is good. But what do we mean by good? Well, probably the best definition of good is, is good is whatever God is. Um, which, again, is a circular argument. But it's a, it's a consistent circular argument. And so what Calvin is doing in this approach, or if you take this approach, is the same sort of thing. What is the ultimate source of authority in theology? Well, it's God's word. But how do we understand God's word by exegesis and, and theology, and systematic theology? So that's how we understand what God's word is. And so what we're dealing with, like uh, what is goodness, uh, or for a rationalist, well, how do you show something to be true? By argument's reason, and you have to show that by reasoning, that's a true... We've got the same sort of thing, dealing with something fundamental, and we get these circular arguments. So circular arguments are not necessarily um, bad. It's just... Uh, we don't like them intuitively. And we can have bad circular arguments, of course. And this idea that um, hermeneutics, uh, the study of interpretation of the Bible, has not missed this, idea, this uh, feature of reading texts, that the reader's worldview affects the way we read the text. And the text affects the reader and the way they look at the world. Now, this has been taken in not just biblical exegesis, but all sorts of hermeneutics of all sorts of texts. But if one person reads the Bible from one culture, they'll read something slightly different from someone else. Or even in our own lives, we go back to the scriptures and we see something new in it. And that affects the way that we live and think about the world. And so the next time we read the Bible, we're reading with this refreshed, renewed look of what the Bible is or the theology it contains. And so we do have this circular process going on. And so we end up, not instead of a pyramid, but a, possibly a roundabout like this. But the circle doesn't really do it full justice either, at least for the Christian. Because what we understand is that there is an advance in our understanding. We read the Bible with the aid of the Holy Spirit, and we understand more about God, more about his creation. 
And then we live out our, our, our lives, this new insightment, insightful view, and we come back to reading the Bible again, a different person, and we see something else. So, we say. so in that sense, there is an advance, hopefully. So it's a picture rather of a, not a circle, but a spiral heading somewhere. Grant Osborne, in his book, The Hermeneutical Spiral, um, writes, scholars since the new hermeneutic have been fond of describing a hermeneutical circle within which our, our interpretation of the text leads to its interpreting us. A spiral is a better metaphor because it is not a closed circle, but rather an open-ended movement. From the horizon, that's a worldview, of the text to the horizon of the reader. So Osborne wants to change this image of a circle into spiral, and then to open the spiral further. It is my final contention, he argues, that the final goal of hermeneutics is not systematic theology, but the sermon. That is proclamation, not explanation. If you took systematic theology is explaining what the Bible is, then you need to proclaim it, which then changes the, the world view of the hearer who comes back to scripture again in a different way. And this just gives, what he's done is given another layer or step in the circular element of the spiral, something like the picture up here. And when you look at that, what he's done there, he's incorporated all those three necessary elements that we saw that Calvin had in his methodology for biblical interpretation. That the Bible is not fully explained until you've got exegesis, you've got theology and then exposition, preaching. And um, this uh, more modern theo theologian engaging with uh, more modern theories of hermeneutics has come to the same sort of uh, approach that Calvin had uh, hundreds of years ago. In the introduction to Osborne's book, The Hermeneutical Spiral, he does not really complete the circle very clearly. Um, good exegesis lifts the reader of the Bible towards better systematic theology and then clearer proclamation, but then how this feeds back into exegesis is left silent. However, in his chapter on systematic theology, he concludes that with some hermeneutical principles, and it's interesting that his first step relates to systematic theology. It is necessary, he argues, to consciously reconstruct our true understanding. If we desire an honest re-examination of the issue, we must carefully define carefully where we and our tradition stand on the doctrine before beginning to study. This will free us to use our pre-understanding positively, to study the evidence, rather than negatively to predetermine our conclusions. So what's he saying there? Well, he's saying this act of doing systematic theology, if you like, examining where we're coming from before engaging with the Bible, it can be used positively, because then we are aware of our... Um, our structures that are thinking that might be affecting us as we engage with the Bible. And so having the institutes or whatever theology that we have in our mind before we approach the text is important because it, it gives us that framework for interpretation but also for reflect about it, we realise where we're at before we meet the scripture. And then the scriptures can challenge us on what our thinking is. If we've got a clear view of our tradition or whatever it is, we turn up with it that the Bible doesn't seem to be saying it at this point, then we're, we are allowing the Bible to uh, challenge us in our thinking, and therefore um, we're more conscious of what's going on, and more conscious that where our theology needs changing. The Bible should direct theology, but theology also informs our reading of the text. Um, so the spiral um, could equally be drawn this exegesis, theology, exposition, exposition, exegesis. Jamie Grant, um, in his module on um, hermeneutics, 
uh, starts or this first uh, thing pointing out that we all do hermeneutics. It's a big fancy word, we've probably never used it before, but <coughs> we all do it. We all interpret the Bible in a certain way. It's a question of whether we do good hermeneutics. Is the, is the problem. And that applies to systematic theology too. Everyone approaches the Bible with a theology. It's a question of is it a good theology? Is it even an atheist theology? But Everyone is approaching the Bible with a theology. And we read the Bible in light of that. And what Calvin's trying to do with the Institutes is have him grapple with the Bible to give a theology to equip the godly reader uh, to read the Old and New Testament rightly. So, in conclusion, Calvin's suggestion... Well, Calvin's suggestion is, what is the use of systematic theology? And its purpose of the Institutes is not far removed to what is going on in the modern view of hermeneutics and the hermeneutical spiral. Systematic theology and the Institutes is not merely a result of the outworking of exegesis. Still less is it seen as a sort of abstract, unhelpful discipline removed from real reading of the Bible, producing all these theories and, and structures that have no re relevance to scripture. No, um, there are undoubtedly systematic theologies that do fit these descriptions of being unhelpful or abstract. But Calvin's Institute and any good systematic theology is a prerequisite for a useful reading of the scriptures. And so as we explore um, the Institutes over the coming weeks, um, we're exploring a document that seeks to, to lay out a biblical framework to enable us, therefore, to engage with the Bible afresh and in a clear way. Okay, so that's all I wanted to cover in this introductory thing, but um, if you have any questions or, or thoughts, uh, we've got time now to uh, discuss. While you're contemplating, next week we're going to look at um, book one, right at the beginning, and um, the idea of census of divinitas, this idea of <coughs> the sense of the divine that everyone has that Calvin suggests. So it's knowing God and knowing ourselves and how we recognise God in creation. And so, forth. so that's the topic of next week uh, before we go on to look at uh, Calvin's doctrine of scripture the following week. As far as the programme goes, um, there is a, a reading week so we've got three weeks together. I think if you've picked up a flyer, it's on there. Um, I think it's set up for three weeks we've got together, and then there's a, a week off, and then we'll reconvene for the following five weeks. It's into December sometime. Hi. Uh, can I just ask, you mentioned uh, Tony Lee in the Reader's Guide to Calvin's Institute. Uh, what about, could you say something about Ford Battle's synopsis? I think he's written a a kind of paperback synopsis of the institutes. Is, is that worth looking at? Or? Well, yeah, it's certainly worth looking at. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit, I mean, it, that is, that's what it says on the title, it's a synopsis. So it's trying to, um, well, in some ways, more complete what I'm trying to do here is to look at the whole of the theology of all institutes in a fairly condensed form. So, yes, it's another resource, and uh, there's lots of resources out there. Um, it's somewhat different from Tony Lane's because Tony Lane's is, is meant to be a reader's guide, so it's it's, it's more pointers, you know, um, little notes saying, "Well, read this section and, and note these sort of features in it." So, so it's really meant as a companion volume to actually reading, whereas a synopsis is, well, as I said, it's trying to condense institutes into one paper, small paperback. Thanks, Trevor. I was just wondering if. They